All scripture is inspired by God Amen. and profitable for teaching, for proof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Amen. All scripture is inspired by God. Uh, it's good to really see you guys again. I, I've been gone. Chris and I were on a cruise. Anybody ever been on a cruise before? Yeah. Save your money, okay? Uh, my wife's not here, so she can't give input on this. Oh, yes, she is. There she is. She liked it. She liked it. She loved it. And I went, and I enjoyed it, and I enjoyed being with my lovely wife. And we saw a lot of nice places. Uh, and there, I'll stop there. Okay. No, it is so good to see the, the, a lot of you, you guys, just good to see you again. All right? I missed you. And uh, so anyway, last week, Israel ended our six months in the Pentateuch. How many learned something about the Pentateuch? All right? All right? Good. It was, a, it was a good time. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed studying it. I learned a lot. And hopefully you guys learned a lot. And hopefully there's a lot of names, a lot of places, a lot of events that happened in the Pentateuch that now you have some kind of idea as to the reference, what was going on in the context. But like Israel said, at the end, the summary is, the message of the Pentateuch is God loves you. Okay? Amen. It's all about God loving us and reaching out to us. And he's reaching out to us every day, every moment, and he's reaching out to us this morning. And I hope that what we share this morning will touch your hearts, okay? Now, what we're going to do is we're going to get into this series called Foundations. If you have been around the church for a while, you may have been here on a Wednesday night when we did a Bible study called Foundations. And uh, how many of you went through the Foundations class with us? Okay, a few of you. And I think, I think the feedback we've always gotten is that it was very helpful, all right? So I'm, this, this should be helpful to you. And I think one of the things I, I need to tell you about this is this is basic, okay? We're not going to get deep here. It's basic. But basic is good. And we all need basic a lot of times just to keep us going. All right, so I want you to open your Bibles, if you have it with you today. And I want you to look at chapter of the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verses 47 through 49. And while you're looking for that, let me just explain that Jesus gave a very important message called the Sermon on the Mount. Okay? Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the... You've probably heard this before. And chances are he probably gave that message many times. But it's recorded in two different places in the Gospels. It's recorded in Matthew, and then it's also recorded, if you didn't know it, it's recorded in the book of Luke. All right? And in both accounts, when he gets to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he says this. Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them, I will show you whom he is like. Now, he's setting up a comparison of two people. Only two. All right? And I want you to notice the comparison. The first guy. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when a flood occurred, the torrent burst against that house. It could not shake it because it had been built well. Now here's the second person. But the other person has heard and not acted accordingly. He is like a man built, who built a house on the ground without a foundation. And the torrent burst against it, and immediately it collapsed. And the ruin of that house was great. So what Jesus is saying in here is that the foundation, the foundation of your life, but more specifically, the foundation of your Christian life, is critical. Amen. Okay? And if that foundation is not well built, if it is not made of good materials, 
if it is not laid right, if it's not square, if it's not solid, it's going to fall apart. Amen. It just takes the right pressure. Now I want you to notice that he gives how many choices here? Two. Not three, not five, two. One is right and one is wrong. And there's really no in between. Now we ain't, I want you to I want you to understand also and hear this that it is not the knowledge of God's word that makes a difference. It is the application. It is the reliance. It is the dependence on God's word that makes the difference. Having Bible knowledge is good. But if you don't apply it in real life situations, it's really of no value to you. John 14, 21 says, he who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me says, I will manifest myself to him. Now, if I don't obey God's word, then I'm not really going to know the Lord I serve. It's through the obedience of God's word that we come to know Jesus, not just having the information in our heads. Now there, let's see here. Let's go to that slide I wanted. I want number two. Actually, it's the last one, Renee. Let's go up there. The last one, the, the photo one. The photo one. There you go. You see that? Isn't that a fabulous picture? I, I love that picture. Now, one of the things that kind of brought this to mind was, uh, how many guys watch Netflix? Okay, anybody ever watched the documentaries about rock climbers on that thing? I mean, I, I love to watch them and I hate to watch them, right? I, I got a very old fear of heights. You know, I don't like heights. When I see a guy on the edge, you know, the, the camera guy's like shooting down. And you know, the guy's, the guy's hanging by a, you know, he's standing on this much of a ledge. And he's, he's just standing there. It's like, there's nothing behind. I was like, grab something, you know. So when I look at this picture, I thought, well, that really is a picture of the Christian life sometimes. You know, we're just hanging on. There have been times in my Christian experience, more than once, where things can become so dark, things can become so dark that it's like all I have is one verse that I'm hanging on to. You ever heard that verse, Psalm 4610, be still, and know that I am God. I mean, there are times, folks, I, I just, I've been in such a place where it's just like, that's all I can do is hang on to that one verse and just keep it going in my mind. And it just keeps me going. Now, I don't want to live there all the time, but sometimes we are there, right? That's, that's it right there, right? We're just hanging on to that bit of truth. What do you hang on to when life gets hard? Thank you, Frank. Life is good, right, Frank? Ten bucks, ten bucks and you're good. In the deep, dark moments of life, think about what do you tell yourself? Where do your thoughts go? Where do you think? Where do you find yourself? Because that really tells you about what your foundation in life is. Now, let's go to slide three. The Christian experience, the Christian life, we, in the Christian life, we face a unique set of circumstances. Okay? Now this is what I mean. Everybody in life experiences difficulty, whether believers, non-believers, Christian, non-Christian. Everybody has difficulty in life. However, 
According to the scriptures, Paul says that we face a very unique struggle in life. And, and he calls it a struggle, all right? Now listen, Ephesians 6, 12. For our struggle, there's the word, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers. Now when he says rulers, I want you to understand something. He is talking about personalities, actual beings with a will, okay? For our struggle is, not, is, is against rulers, it's against powers, it's against world forces of darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Folks, if you're not aware of this, then you're really operating in the dark. You're operating in half a world. Does anybody, I, I t said this one time before, there are two realities. Anybody know what they are? There's the physical reality and the spiritual reality. Now I want you to think about this. Which came first? The spiritual reality. That is the real reality. It is the spiritual reality that gave rise to the physical reality. And we need to live in that spiritual reality. And that spiritual reality is a place where evil dwells. And our Christian existence is a spiritual existence. And we face a unique enemy. The, it's called, he's called who? The devil. Satan. Okay? You need to be aware of this because that is your experience as a Christian. And you're going to face certain warfare, certain battles in life that are not physical, they're spiritual. Amen. And there's a way to face those battles that's unique. A word of caution about all this, okay? First of all, do you know what Satan's greatest strategy is? Do you know what his greatest defense is? His greatest deception. You know what his greatest deception is? He doesn't exist. Thank you. That's from uh... Yeah. That's his greatest that's his greatest deception is he doesn't exist. Listen, we're a modern people. We have science, okay? We send people to the moon. Uh, we have iPhones. Satan? That's kind of a medieval war. I mean, that isn't something that was just used in the 1600s to explain things, you know, when things get bad. No, it's a reality. And if you don't understand it, if you don't embrace it, okay, you're operating in the dark. You really are. But I want to give you some, some cautions here. Don't give Satan more credit than he deserves. Either, okay? I think sometimes we give Satan attributes and powers that he doesn't have Amen. that are not biblical all right so he's not for example he's not omnipresent what does omnipresent mean he's not everywhere at once all right so if you woke up this morning and you yelled at your friend or your wife or your husband or something like that you can't say the devil made me do it <laughs> because that I have it in good authority he was he was actually in another city making some other guy mad at his wife okay <laughs> He can't be in two places at once. But he still has influence throughout the world because he has an army. They're called demons. All right. Anybody ever read a book called Screwtape Letters by C.S. Lewis? Get a, hot, get a hold of that book and read it. It is a tremendous, tremendous insight into the world of demons. You'll enjoy it. It's a good read. It's a fun read. But he's not omnipresent. He's not everywhere. He can't force you to do things. He cannot make you act against your will. The devil made me do it is not true. Okay? Who said that? Who was that? Flip Wilson. The devil made me. No. He can't make you do it. All right? He can't read your mind. He doesn't know what you're thinking. Okay? But he probably has a pretty good idea of what you're thinking. You've got to understand that Satan has studied humanity for a long time. And he's got us pretty well figured out. 
And one of the things he can do, and he does do, and that is he can influence your mind. And that really is his game, to influence your thinking. To, for example, make you believe he's not there. He will influence your thinking. I want to give you two examples. Now, Genesis chapter 3. First of all, there are only two encounters, there are only two times in the Bible where Satan encounters some specific person face to face. All right? Just know that. You, I, I doubt that anybody in this, class, this room ever really faces Satan personally. There are only two encounters in the scriptures where Satan spoke directly to a person. Anybody know where those two situations are? Yes, ma'am. Jesus and Eve. Jesus and Eve. Now, in both situations, we're going we're gonna to look for a strategy here he uses, all right? In, the, in Genesis chapter 3, he comes to, the, to Eve and he, he poses a question. And he says, surely, has God, has God really said this? Has God really said this? Is this what God said? You shall not eat from the tree of the garden of evil? Or the tree from the tree of the garden? God really say that? Do you really mean it? What does he mean by that? What is he doing? He is casting doubt. See, that's his strategy. That's how he influences your thinking. When Jesus was in the desert for 40 days and, and Satan came to him, the first thing he said to him is, if you really are the Son of God, then doubt, question. Anybody ever had a doubt about their Christian faith? Of course, we all have. Just know that that's part of the spiritual battle. It's not sin to have questions. It's not wrong. We're going to do it. But how do you respond? See, Satan wants us to doubt because if he can get us to doubt, then he can get us discouraged. Amen. And all of our thoughts are turned inward. All we're doing is we're self-absorbed. And once he can get us discouraged, then he can get us paralyzed. He can get us to stop. And that's where he wants us. Amen. He wants us sidelined. See, if we're, not, if we're not active in the Christian faith, if we're not moving forward, we're not a threat to him. He's, we're out of the picture. That guy over there, he's fine. Leave him alone. He's not a threat to us. That's Satan's game, to cast doubt, to bring discouragement, and eventually to paralyze you in your faith. Amen. We're all going to be there. It's all going to happen at some point in time. But you see, doubt is like a poison. It works slowly, but it works. And how do you counteract a poison? You need an antidote. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6, in addition to all taking up the shield of faith with which you'll be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one. Of who? The evil one. And what's he doing? He's shooting flaming missiles. And what are those missiles? Doubt. So when I hold up the shield of faith, what am I holding up? What is it that I'm holding up? The Word of God. See, the Word of God is how I defend myself. When I first became a Christian, uh, back before the Civil War, <laughs> the guy that led me to Christ, uh, Renee, you want to bring up that next slide for us, please? The guy that led me to Christ gave me this little packet. It's called Beginning with Christ. This whole series of messages we're going to be going through the next few weeks is based on that little book. All right? That little book was critical to me because it gave me information I needed to begin my Christian walk. And inside that little book were these five little cards. They were memory verse cards. 
And I still got them. Same cards he gave me 40 some years ago. All right? Good stuff. And one of the things he said to me was, memorize these five verses. Wow. Simple thing. Simple truth. But that was one of the greatest things I ever learned in the Christian life. To memorize these five verses. These five verses are going to be the topics for the next five weeks. And then we're going to end with a, a lesson on baptism. So over the next five weeks, as we come together, we're going to take each of these verses and we're going to go through them. And I still have them memorized. You ready? First John, First John 5, 11 and 12. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He who has the son, he who has the son, has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. In verse 13, I write this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. First question, am I really a Christian? Do I really have Jesus in my heart? I mean, all I did was say a little prayer. Is he really there? I mean, it did, I, I don't feel any different. Did something happen? Yes. How do I know? It's a promise. If I have the Son, what do I have? Eternal life. It's that simple. Okay? It's not a feeling. You know, nobody came back to life. It's just the truth based on a promise. Second verse, John 16, 24, Jesus was talking to his disciples. He says, up until now, up until now, I mean, in the Old Testament, up until now you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Next question. Does God hear prayer? Yes. yes. How do I know? I got a promise. Amen. Jesus said, ask in my name and you will receive. Amen. Okay, it's a promise. Not a feeling, not a theory, it's a promise. Next verse, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation as it were taking you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your strength. Will you be tempted? Yes. Is temptation wrong? No, because we all face it. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. He's not going to take away the temptations, but he's going to give you the ability to live successfully and face temptation with victory. Amen. Victory over sin. Can God help me get over a bad habit, a bad addiction? Yes, yes. yes. it's a promise. Next promise. First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he is, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Look, Lord, I, I've been a Christian for a while. I have sinned a lot. I, I've gotten back into some old habits. I've fallen off. I've gotten, you know. Can you still forgive me? Yes. yes. Because the forgiveness of Jesus is continuous. Amen. It goes on and on and on. It never ends. There's always forgiveness. No, far, no matter how far you've drifted away. Finally, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Yeah. And do not rely on your own insight. In all your ways, what? Acknowledge him. And he will make straight your paths. Does God have a plan for me? I mean, am, I'm a Christian, but I don't know. Where am I going in life? I mean, what's my purpose? What should I do? Does God have a plan? Yes. He has a purpose for you. When I became a Christian, having a purpose was, I mean, that's like, that was so important to me. It's still important to me. I want to know my life's counting for something. Yes, you have a purpose. But I've really, I've lived a troubled life. I've made a lot of mistakes. Does God still have a purpose? Yes. How do I know? It's a promise. Okay? It's a promise. These are five foundational truths. Are these all the truths, all the promises of Scripture? No. But these are five important ones. Okay. These are five things that Satan will try to derail you on. And so we're going to talk deeply about each one of these things. 
We want to get them in our hearts. So that when we're hanging, you know, we've got that, that rock, we've got that promise we're hanging on. Let me say this verse again. All scripture is inspired by God. It's profitable for teaching, for proof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. These are five promises, not five theories, okay? Not, not five positive thoughts, all right? They are positive, but they're five promises from the Word of God. This is what we live by. This is what we hang on to. Not the miraculous. Is God capable of healing people and making them well again? Yes, praise God, it happens. But if you're living on the basis of that kind of faith, your foundation is weak because all of that fades. Do you have friends that are energetic and, you know, they're always up for Jesus? They have lots of passion for the Lord. Gosh, I wish I had that kind of passion for the Lord. They're always on this sort of this emotional mountaintop. And you're thinking, I wish I was like that person. You don't have to be like that person. Okay? That's a personality, not a, not a, not a spiritual trait. You just need the Word of God. Amen. You just need to rest on the promises of God's Word. Let's go back to that slide again up here. Bring it back for us a second here, Renee. I want you to look at that picture. Now think deeply. What is the foundation of your life? What do you believe is the truth about the reality of this world? What do you rest on? When, you, when life is dark, when life is dark, what do you tell yourself? That is where your foundation is. And our foundation needs to be rock solid Jesus only. Okay? Rock solid Jesus only. Because when the torrents come, remember what Jesus said? When the storm comes, we want that house to withstand the storm. Let's pray. Father, we can never overestimate, we can never totally appreciate the power, the faithfulness of your word. We simply don't understand how perfect it is. We don't understand how eternal it is. We don't understand how powerful it is in our lives. Help us, God. Help us to take it into our hearts. Believe it and live according to it. Each day, each moment, in Jesus' name, amen. amen.